Hi, thanks for joining me. Today, I've got a very different video on my channel. Normally, I'm solving a maths problem, but today I'm joined by Isabel, who's a third year engineering student at St Anne's College in Oxford. Today, we're going to be doing a, uh, a mock interview for Oxford. Um, it's going to be a maths interview, so uh, maybe slightly different to what you're normally used to seeing, Isabel, with engineering, all the kind of physics and mechanics -y stuff. Um, but hopefully, I can keep you on your toes and uh, uh, you can answer the questions. Obviously, it's been three years or so since you did your interviews. Uh, I guess you probably haven't thought about them much since then, I, I guess. No, I blanked them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, you kind of maybe wanted to forget about them. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> awesome. We'll, we'll get stuck in in a second. But for the viewers at home, how this is going to work is uh, maths interviews at Oxford are generally half an hour long. You'll normally do two or three if you get to the interview stage at Oxford. And each interview, as I say, half an hour long, they're normally all done online through a platform like Zoom. Um, and there'll be two questions, normally kind of longer questions, around 15 minutes each. Um, so the, the interview itself will take around about half an hour. And normally in the call, there'll be an interview or two interviewers, potentially even three. And normally the first question is asked by the first interviewer and the other one takes notes. And then they swap over after 15 minutes and the other one asks the, the second question. Um, so I'm going to be doing something like similar uh, today, except obviously there's just me interviewing. So... Um, I will be scribbling away during the interview, so don't worry too much about that as well. And then at the end of it, I'll just give you some some feedback, some notes. And also for the viewers at home, this is a chance for you to uh, maybe whilst she's doing the interview, pay attention to maybe some of the things that she says, some of the things, how she answers her questions and um, think about how that could be maybe beneficial to you as well. Um, but before we get stuck in, do you have any questions, Isabel? Uh, no, I don't think so. Awesome. No worries. Well, I'm going to open up a whiteboard and we'll get stuck in. Okay, so here we go. First problem. Um, so this problem is going to be about infinite series and infinite sums. How familiar are you with those? Do you know what the, an infinite sum is? Um, it's a group, uh, a list of many things added together in infinitely, I suppose. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Can you give me an example of one? Maybe you know. Uh... Um. Maybe like sine x is an if you it can be defined as an infinite sum as a um as terms of x rather than yeah absolutely right yeah so we call yeah. that like a Taylor series or a Maclaurin series um so we use that a lot in maths uh, yeah absolutely that that's an example of a type of infinite sum um one thing that we as mathematicians are normally quite interested in is whether an infinite sum converges or diverges. Um, what do we mean exactly by an infinite sum converging or diverging? What, what do those terms mean? Uh, converging means it like reaches, as you add them all up, it reaches a finite value, whereas mm -hmm. uh, diverging means that it just goes off to infinity or negative infinity and do doesn't reach a value at the end. Yeah, you know, you're pretty close. So converging is, is correct. It kind of it home, hones in on a limit. Um, mm -hmm. So as you take more and more terms, it approaches this a, a certain value. There is a rigorous definition of a limit or what it means for something to converge, but that's kind of a broadly speaking what it is. But diverges just means it doesn't converge. So it could go to infinity or minus infinity, or it could do some weird oscillation. So it could be like one minus one, one minus one, one minus one. And then it, we just say it doesn't converge. And so it diverges. So what we're going to be doing today in uh, this problem is going to be looking at um, a question uh, or a particular infinite series and trying to establish whether it converges or diverges. And that uh, particular series is going to be the harmonic sum or the harmonic series. Have you heard of this before? Uh, not that I recognize of, no. That's fine. Absolutely fine. No problem. So the harmonic sum is a very pretty sum. It's the sum of the reciprocals of the positive integers. So uh, if I call it S, let's say it's going to be 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4. And you get the idea. Mm -hmm. And we're going on forever um, with this infinite sum. Um, when you first look at this, if you were to just hazard a guess, would you say that this infinite series converges or diverges? Uh, converges. Converges. Why would you say that? What what tells you that this might converge? Um, because they're all getting smaller. So you would think that you, eventually you're just adding really really small values. So it would eventually all just like be the same value over and over. 
interesting yeah so the terms do get smaller and smaller they get closer to zero so we're going to explore whether it converges or diverges obviously as mathematicians we like a proof so it's great to have an intuition which can normally lead us on the way uh, to a proof but we want to have some kind of clear-cut um reasoning for why this either converges or diverges okay so we're going to explore that and we're, what we're going to do is start by sketching a graph so what i'd like for you to do is mm -hmm. can you just sketch the graph maybe i'll draw some axes for you okay. um the graph y equals one over x and just for positive values of x so I'll okay. see, just roughly speaking what would y equals one over x Let's okay so when y is so when x is really small then y is going to be really big so it's going to go to, go to infinity as you go as x reach uh, goes to zero so we're going to go up here and then as x becomes uh bigger then y is going to reach zero over time because it's going to be a really small value so we're going to reach the limit as uh y, as x gets bigger so then it's going to be a curve round to reach that something like that oh sorry yeah perfect really nicely drawn as well yeah so that's what this graph <clears throat> y equals one over x looks like okay cool you may have to zoom in on your uh onto the graph i'm going to draw some some points on onto this graph mm -hmm. uh, in particular i'm going to use the the positive integers here so i'm going to put one on here two on here three on here four on here five on here and obviously that, that carries on um yeah. so i'm going to draw a little vertical line here from one what would the y value be up here it would be one one yeah one over one which is one we're going to do something similar here. Oh, whoops, so that's supposed to be a vertical line. And we're going to do this for all of these guys. And I'm going to draw some rectangles on onto this. And these rectangles are going to look something like this. Like so. And obviously I could do this as many rectangles as I wanted. Okay, um, if we start from this rectangle here, mm -hmm. what would the area of that rectangle be? So we know that at x equals 2, then y is going to be a half. So it's just going to be, and we know the width of the rectangle is 1, so it's just going to be 1 times a half, so it's going to be a half. Perfect, exactly, yep, the area is a half. How about the other rectangles? What would the areas of those be? Uh, so if you just evaluate them all, so they're all a width one, so it's just going to be the same as the y value. So the first one's going to be one, and then it's going to be a third, and then a quarter, and then a fifth. Perfect. Yeah. So we get a half, a third, a quarter, a fifth, and so on. So we can see there's maybe something to do with the harmonic series. Here we're getting these reciprocals of integers. So from this observation of this graph, what conclusion can we make about the harmonic series? Can we make a conclusion? Uh, how can we relate this to the harmonic sum? Um, the the areas of the rectangles are going to sum to give you, as you go along, to give you the harmonic sum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, almost, because we don't have a rectangle with area 1, but that doesn't really matter too much. We can just say that this is S minus 1. So the yeah. area of the rectangles oh, equals S minus 1. Okay, but we're trying to establish whether this converges or diverges. How does using this graph help us establish something like that? Um, I suppose it. you can see how the rectangles are changing as you go along, um, and they're getting smaller and smaller. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So you're yeah. Right. the rectangles are certainly getting smaller and smaller. Uh, but let's think about this curve that we've drawn. This y equals one over x. What can we say about the rectangles in relationship to the curve? Um, the the rectangles are bounded by the curve. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, they're, they're bounded above by this right. curve. So that I guess can provide us an upper bound for s minus one. So what would this upper bound be? Um, it would just be the integral under the curve. Yeah. So what would that evaluate to? 
um, 1 over x. So if you integrate 1 over x, it would be ln x. So it would just Mm -hmm. be... So yeah, maybe if you show this on the whiteboard, what Oh, yeah, would sorry. the, Yeah, yeah. the calculation be? That's fine. Get right. Um, so Sorry, I can't quite see your your cursor. no, no, sorry, it it just Ah, okay, came no worries. up. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's fine. No worries. No worries. Um, right. So if we do the integral of one over x, um, dx. So from I suppose if we're going from one to infinity, Nice. well, we Yeah. just hit the limit. So we'll just this is really okay. Um, and then that will. equate to ln x between uh one and one um and um learn of as the limit goes to infinity learn would go to um Um, So yeah, lin of x grows quite slowly, but it does a, it does actually go to infinity when x is a really large number. Um, yeah, I mean, you can think about that as e to the x, um, kind of goes on forever. So if you ref remember e e to the x and ln of x are inverse functions. So yeah, one you reflect one. If one goes to kind of in has a or another way to think about this is the the range of this function, which is what we're trying to establish as x goes to infinity, is equal to the domain of e to the x, and that. also allows for x to be a, 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 an arbitrary large number. Um, so yeah, this does equal kind of infinity minus ln of 1. What's Which ln is of 1? zero. 0, yeah. Zero. So we get infinity. Like, obviously, infinity is not a number, so we're kind of abusing the notation here, but we get that s minus 1 is less than infinity, which isn't super useful because that's obviously true. Yeah. And the s minus 1 is less than infinity. Okay, cool. Not the end of the world, but interesting. We We do... At least we found a sort of bound on this. But what's really interesting is we can use a really similar technique to get a lower bound on s minus 1 as well. So what we're going to do is draw another graph. I'm going to draw the graph 1 over x again, same as before. But now we want to draw our rectangles in such a way that we're allowed to then establish a lower bound on s. So how could we use this? Uh, so if we draw 1 over x again, look something. Oh. So one over x means the same. In fact, maybe I'll let you draw it because I'm not sure why my pen's not. <laughs> Doesn't want to draw a nice smooth curve. Perfect, yeah. So if we draw our rectangles in maybe a similar manner to before, how could we draw them to maybe now establish a lower bound on S? Um, could you draw them so that they go up woods up above Um, so what, what do you mean by about upward, sorry? um Wait, sorry, we're finding the uh, lower bound. So we, we want to find a lower bound on S, so maybe So, we can show that S is at least some value. um, I was thinking, like, you could evaluate the rectangle at, at so the first one would go up to one, and then the Mm second, -hmm. So what would that look like on our, uh, so the we other. drew a re rectangles previously, what would that look like on here? Uh, so if this is one, and then evaluate that one at like that. Yeah. Okay, nice. I see, I see, I see, I see. Cool. Okay, cool. So here we can see the rectangles uh, are going to kind of be slightly bigger than the, the one at one over x. Okay, cool. So now we can do a similar thing here. What are the areas of the rectangles? And what is the, yeah, so in this case, what would the, if we obviously drew these rectangles forever, what would the area be? Um, it would be equal to S. Um, yes, it would be equal to s. Amazing, yeah, because the first one is one, then it's a half, a third, and so on. So that would be precisely what s is. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we can do something similar and say, um, um, yeah, so how can we now establish a lower bound on s? Um...
Um, So we previously found an upper bound on S. Yeah. We showed, um, and we did that by kind of, show, in the previous diagram, we had the uh, the curve was above the rectangles. And so we can say the integral of the curve is bigger than the area of the rectangles. Whereas here we have the rectangles are above the curve. Yeah, I'm, but we could find the integral again, but that will just give mm -hmm. us infinity. Yeah. Yeah. But you're exactly right. So, yeah. so here... What we, we, we compute the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x dx, and same as before, that, that's what infinity in inverted commas. So what does yeah. this tell us about s? Um, that it must, it, that, it, that the sum will just go to infinity. Or, yeah. And so what, yeah. what, what do we call that? What's the technical term for that? It's a diverging series. Yeah, it's a diverging series, which I think is really counterintuitive. So yeah, we started I agree. off with this uh, with this sum. Yeah. Well, the first time I saw this, I was like, oh, what? This this diverges. Uh, so it's a really interesting sum. The terms get closer and closer to zero, but it approaches infinity. So this here is a lovely counterexample or a, a really good problem to kind of test your intuition. So it's really counterintuitive, um, but this does diverge. Um, we won't go into depth here, but interestingly, what you can do is if you modify this slightly, if you, let's say, call Sn the sum of the first n terms of this harmonic sum, so a finite sum, mm -hmm. and you just go up to 1 over n, what's interesting is you can use a very similar technique and you can show something like Sn is less than, I can't remember exactly what it is, but Sn you're going to get is approximately ln of n, broadly speaking. And this kind of shows you why it diverges, but really slowly, because ln, if you think of a graph of ln, it grows really, really slowly. So it looks like it's flattening out. It isn't flattening out, but it grows really, really slowly. And that's why this sum grows really, really slowly. I think if you add the first 1,000 terms of this sum, you just about pass 10. So if you do 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3, and so on up to 1 over 1,000, you get 10 point something. So it grows really, really slowly. Um, but cool. Um, very nicely done. So that was our first problem um, done. We'll move swiftly into our second problem. So maybe I'll draw a big line here. Um, cool. So now doing something slightly different, what I want you to do uh, or is we're going to look at some sums. So this time just finite sums. So we looked at infinite sums. Now we're going to look at finite sums. So um, we're going to start with a fairly common one. So triangular numbers, if you've seen this before, are defined by this sum here. So now a finite sum of the first n integers. Um, do you know what this evaluates to? This um, sum? Probably should. Um, no, I don't. <laughs> Sorry. That's OK. No worries. How would you go about trying to work out um, what this equals in terms of n? Um... Um, trying to find a relationship between the the numbers as you go along, and but it's okay. not that seems, that seems pretty sensible. Yeah, is this, yeah. Um, this this um sum is a special type of sum which maybe like kind of falls into a family of sums. Do you know what the the name of that type of that family of sums is? Um. No, I, I don't think so. Pause! I've decided to set up my own tutoring company to help you study maths at a top university. So if you like the way I explain things, go check it out. Let's get on with the video. So this here is an, a, an arithmetic series, so where the difference kind of goes up by a fixed amount each time. Um, so yeah, it turns out yeah, there's a formula for this. It's not super exciting, um, but it's n times n plus 1 over 2. And the way that you can prove this, so one way you can do it is kind of by doing what you said, by kind of maybe exploring the first few, few sums, so maybe doing 1, 1 plus 2, 1 plus 2 plus 3, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, seeing if there's a pattern and maybe you could prove it by induction. Um, in fact, there was a, quite a few ways to prove this. Um, so there's a very famous way of doing it that Gauss did, but I won't get into that at the moment. What we're going to be doing is trying to explore sums like this 
So we're going to look to begin with, with one cubed plus two cubed and so on up to n cubed. Now, this is a form, there is a formula for this. And normally the way that students are taught is to prove the formula by induction. Why is induction maybe not a great proof technique? Um, I mean, it certainly proves the result, but what, what could you say is maybe a, a disadvantage to proving something by induction? Um, is, so induction is the one where you prove it, like, because there's like previous things. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, uh, I suppose it doesn't consider like all possible case. Like, you know, it like, um, it, it. So if I told you the formula for this. Yeah. Is let's say n squared. So I'll tell you what the formula is, and we're going to prove this in a moment. Is okay. n squared times m plus one squared over four? And I said prove it by induction. I'm sure you could, but and that, that would be a valid proof. But what's kind of missing from that? What why why would that not be as maybe as satisfying a proof as maybe a different type of proof? I suppose you're not proving it like from its origins. You're just proving it from the fact that it's there's it's something's happened before so it's gonna happen again um, kind of. so the, the first part you said was kind of true so here the issue is like i kind of have to tell you this formula in yeah. order for you to prove it by induction if i don't tell you what this formula is you can't really do a proof by induction and one of the really cool things about math is kind of understanding where a formula comes from so if i kind of pluck this out of thin air and said this is true it'd be very easy to prove but it wouldn't give us any kind of inkling as to well how would we go about doing other things like proving similar things if i place the threes here with fours or fives so what we're going to be doing uh, in this problem is trying to explore well maybe how do we uh, try and evaluate this without just having to kind of result uh, by resort to using induction cool um so we'll start off with a very simple thing uh, i just want you to uh, simplify this um, expression for me. R plus one. Oh, actually, I've realized maybe I don't want to do the cubes today because I've given you the formula. Let's, let's do the squares. So one squared plus two squared plus three squared and so on up to n squared. What we're going to try and do is work out a formula for this guy. And to start with, what I want you to do is simply expand and simplify R plus one cubed minus R cubed. So what would this simplify to? Um, Take your time, you can expand it however you like. Yeah, yeah sorry. Just keep right, cool. Um, so we know that we know that our r plus one cubed can be written out as this minus r yeah. cubed so then if we just expand the brackets so we're going to get r r squared plus 2r plus 1 and then r plus 1 minus r3 and then it's going to be r3 um plus 2r squared plus r plus r squared plus 2r plus 1 minus r cubed and then you can cancel the R nice. cubes, and then we are left with three R squared. Uh, yeah, plus three R plus one. Perfect. Very yeah. nice. Yeah, three R squared plus three R plus one. Amazing. So that's what this uh expression equals. Cool. Seems pretty random, but this will become relevant in a second. What we're gonna do on both sides is take this kind of identity. Let me just rewrite R plus one cube minus R cubed here. I'll copy and paste this underneath. And now what we're going to do is just put a big summation sign on both sides. So we're going to do the sum from r equals 1 to n on this side. And then that must be the same as the sum from r equals 1 to n of this side, because they're the same things that we're summing, just written slightly differently. OK. And what we're going to do is try and simplify each side. So. Are you familiar with this sigma notation? The sum yeah. from awesome, amazing, cool. So uh, maybe we'll start with the left-hand side here. 
how could we work out the value of the left hand side, the sum from r equals one to n of r plus one cubed minus r cubed? Um, um, so it's just going to be the next term cubed minus, uh, it's going to be, N. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, it's, so if it was like n1, it would be two cubed minus one cubed. And then it would be, um, so you could, um, so you're quite close with what you were saying before, so. The first term, if you were to kind of write out all the terms of the first term. Oh, they're going to cancel, aren't they? Nice, yeah. So yeah, maybe yeah, can you yeah. illustrate that? How would that cancel? That's fine. How um, would, that, how would uh, you illustrate them cancelling? So if you write them all out, it would be 3 cubed minus 2 cubed uh, plus, yeah, et cetera. And then plus 4 cubed minus 3 cubed. And then, yeah, so all of these middle terms are going to cancel. So you're just going to left with... Uh, so you're just going to be left with n cubed minus 1 cubed. Almost, not quite n cubed minus 1 cubed, very close there. Oh, sorry, n plus 1 cubed, yeah. n plus 1 n cubed, plus yeah, one, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, cool, nice. So this is what we call a telescoping sum, when you get these really nice, all the middle terms cancel out. And the, I think the reason it's called a telescoping sum is because you think about those old-fashioned telescopes where you kind of collapse them all the middle terms disappear. So it's a, that, that's why we call that a telescoping sum. Okay, cool. So we've evaluated the left side of our equation, n cubed minus one cubed or n cubed minus one. Okay, cool. Now what we're gonna do on the right-hand side, what I'm gonna do is start by splitting this up. So you may have seen this before, we can kind of split this sum up. So I'm gonna write it as the sum from r equals one to n of r squared, plus three times the sum from r equals one to n of r, plus um, well, just a sum from r equals 1 to n of 1, like so. Now, this is the thing that we're interested in. So we kind of want to work out what that is. But in order to do that, I guess we need to know what these two guys are. Mm -hmm. What would those two guys at the end be equal to? Um, so the the middle, uh, the first one is, so the sum of uh, the r terms is what we saw at the beginning it's just the very nice yeah the, very nice very nice yeah integers and then the last term will just be n because you're just summing one n times perfect yeah exactly so um if we write this out so we've got n cubed minus one oops n cubed minus one equals three times the thing that we want plus three n n plus one over two minus n Amazing. And now all we need to do is rearrange this to make um, the sum of r squared, the formula, so the subject of the formula, which I'm sure you could do. And then you can do some simplification, maybe, you know, factorize, blah, blah, blah. And you get a very nice closed formula for the sum from r equals one to n of r squared. It turns out that this is one sixth n, n plus one, two n plus one. Um, so you may have seen this formula before, but normally the ways that uh, most students know how to prove this is by induction, which proves it, but doesn't really give you an inkling of intuition. But this is quite cool, I'd say. We, we've got now an expression for the sum of the first uh, n square numbers. Okay, cool. So now, how would you use a similar technique to try and find a formula for the sum of the first n cube numbers. So if we wanted to work out the sum from r equals one to n of r cubed and find a formula for that, how could we do that? Um, could we do a similar thing where, so we just do r plus one um, to the power of four minus r to the power of four and then rewrite it as, yes, r. So you expand that out. And then rewrite. So then the left side will be terms of r cubed and r squared mm -hmm. and r and then plus one. And then you can just 
and now we've got the sum of the R cube terms. No, R squared terms, then we can find the sum of the R cube terms by the same logic. Nice, yeah. Nice, exactly. Perfect. Yeah. So we now know what the R squared formula is. We know what the sum of the first R numbers is. So we can already kind of use those and then rearrange that and get um um R cubed. Great. Awesome. So you can maybe see how this generalizes. So if I wanted to know, for example, the sum from R equals one to N of R to the power of 50, um, what kind of, obviously I'm not asking you to, to find a formula for this, but what, what process could you undertake to try and to, to work out what this was? Or if you had the aid of a computer to help you, maybe what, what would you do? I mean, you could just, yeah, iterate through and just keep doing it. So find so R4 and then you can find R, the sum of R5 and then R6 and then just keep going nice. until you find the sum of uh, yeah. the R2. Exactly, the perfect. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Really nicely done. Yeah, so that, that's how we can do that. That's one way of doing it. There are actually some other ways which are very interesting to, to kind of delve into. Um, so it turns out that this thing here will be a polynomial of degree n plus one, uh, sorry, 51 um, in this case. So we can do other things to, to well, that we, stuff that we know about polynomials to help us evaluate this. Um, but yeah, this method is quite nice. So this is sometimes known as a method of differences. Um, but awesome. We will probably call it there. So you can breathe. Um, you can relax. Um, how did you find that? Yeah, no, it's right. It took me back. I do remember doing sums like this um a long time ago so yeah <laughs> it's all, all coming back to me slowly but yeah <laughs> nice yeah so maybe this reminded you of maybe maths verb maths a level yeah definitely uh, some of the stuff you did then uh certainly like the second stuff was a uh, prime example of that so like this is something you almost certainly would have done at a level further maths and proved by induction um so most students sitting in the interview would have seen or would, would would be familiar with this sort of stuff or would be like very fresh to them but obviously I guess you haven't done it in a few years but I think you did very very well overall um so yeah I, I made some notes we'll go through those in um just a second um but yeah just for the viewers at home hopefully uh, you enjoyed that kind of got to see um what it was like Isabel didn't know any of the questions ahead of time and I kind of put her on the spot uh so it's been what three years or so since you did your interview so yeah. um with basically no preparation you did very very well um yeah so let, let's let's start with the kind of the first problem so uh gave you this problem and you explained very well what a convergent sequence was and what a divergent was so maybe a small um misunderstanding of the definition of divergent but that's totally fine um normally in interviews they'll give you small introductory questions like this which are normally relatively short answers um the reason for that is so that a, most students will be able to answer them, but B, just to kind of build the confidence of the person sitting in the interview is just getting them into the mood of talking. So, um, yeah, you answer that well, sketch the graph of one over X with no problems whatsoever. And um, you, what I really liked is when you were sketching the graph, you kind of explained why. So you said, oh, when X is really small and positive, Y is going to be like very close to infinity. So you drew this part and then you explained this part. And then kind of did this and you did it at a good level of without kind of over explaining as well um so whilst you draw it um explaining is good one of the biggest tips i give to my my students is to think out loud when they're doing the interviews and i think at this stage you did this really really well you, you kind of spoke about how you're getting this graph and not just kind of reciting it from memory um awesome um da -da 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 -da. yeah and so then you um so once we drew these rectangles, um, you what well, accurately calculated the area of them. That wasn't super difficult. Um, but then this part where we were trying to establish that it was underneath the curve, um, maybe it wasn't super uh, immediately obvious or not. Um, but yeah, so the areas of the rectangles obviously will be now less than the areas. It's going to be an underestimate of the integral. And that allows us to find an upper bound on this sum S. Um, and... Yeah, and then you accurately identified how we relate this to find this lower bound. So we found the lower bound of S down here, um, and you you realized, okay, I can do something really similar to above, which is good. So that's one of the things that look look out for in interviews is they want to see, can you think about the things you previously learned in earlier in that interview question and apply them elsewhere? So the point of interviews is very much to kind of give student, uh, the, the tutors a chance to see, are these students 
people who they can see accurate, you know, uh, feasibly studying at uh, Oxford, where you'll get thrown a lot of new information. And then with that information, um, you want to be able to take that on, uh, maybe apply it in un unfamiliar territory, unfamiliar settings, and kind of using techniques that you used the, like previously. So here, we use a very similar technique to above to find a lower bound. Um, so that's kind of what they're looking out for. So I think you did this part really, really well. Um, yeah, I think that that was one of the main things um, for that. One thing I didn't quite get uh, have enough time to get into is kind of a generalization of this. So uh, you're curious, there's something called the integral test for infinite series. So if you have a nice uh, infinite sum, and I won't really define what that is, but it basically just means the terms have to be positive. You can say that the sum of f of n, where n is some function, from n equals 1 to infinity, this converges if and only if the integral from 1 to infinity of f of x dx converges. Um, so that there's some broad terms and conditions to that about what type of function f has to be, but this is just kind of an example. In fact, you use a very similar technique to prove this result. Um, but okay, do you have any other comments or questions about the first problem, Isabel? No, no, that yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, will make sense. Yeah, oh, good. Awesome, cool. That's that's good to hear. Yeah, so I think that one is done. But actually, this was actually one of my interview questions when I uh, applied, or at least from memory, was broadly speaking, they got me to try and find this uh, the the value of this harmonic sum, and I've not seen this proof before, so I thought it was quite cool. Um, okay, let's move on to the second problem. So, um. We looked at 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 up to n. And I remember you saying that you should know the formula, but you couldn't. And that's totally fine. In an interview, they're not expecting you to memorize a bunch of formulas. That's not what maths is about. Um, that, like Lots of times you'll know that a formula exists. So I, I thought that was the case here. You knew that there was a formula. You just couldn't recall it. And certainly as a third year engineer, I presume you wouldn't need to know this formula um, anyway. No, so not. it's probably <laughs> long run out of memory. So that's absolutely yeah. fine. Um, so... Um, yeah, so these formulas, I mean, formulas like this, I'd say, where possible to students looking to do it, who are about to do a math interview, it's probably useful to just memorize your formulas more just as a uh, point of view of nerves, because obviously on the day in the interview, if you forget a formula that can make you, in, during the interview, just add to the nerves. Um, so if where possible, students who are looking to prepare for interviews, I'd advise them to try and memorize their formulas. A really easy way to do that is take your formula book take the uh, important formulas from there and just make flashcards on them. Um, but yeah, and cool. So we looked at this proof here to look at the sum of the first n square numbers. Um, so we looked at the difference of uh, consecutive cubes here. You perfectly expanded this. Um, I'd probably say um, maybe a slightly easy way of ex easier way of expanding this is using the binomial expansion, or potentially if you know like the difference of two cubes formula, uh, you could use that as well, but nothing wrong with kind of doing it this way. Uh, I mean, it works. And you get a formula for that. And then you uh, noticed when we were doing this part here, where we were doing the sum of the left-hand side, um, you kind of realized that it was something to do with 2 cubed minus 1 cubed, 3 cubed minus 2 cubed. And I felt that maybe at that point you may have been diverting onto a different path. So I tried to get you back on the right path and say, no, no, you are, you are correct. Um, and then it was nice that you kind of wrote out these terms here. Although one thing I would say is when you're writing out the, a sum like this um, and you've got more terms, so like if you've got, so if I just write this again here, you've got two cubed minus one cubed plus three cubed minus two cubed and so on. I'd always advise to write down the last term or the last few terms as well, because then that avoids the mistake of writing n cubed here when in actuality it's n plus one cubed. Um, so actually, yeah, so this should have been an n plus one cubed here um, and in the later work as well. Um, but yeah, so just whenever you're writing out a sum, write out the start and the end. Um, and one other thing I made a comment on was there were lots of times in, in this, particularly the second problem where you would explain something, you would explain it very well, just maybe I'd say use the whiteboard to your advantage as well. So uh, if possible, what I advise students to do is get practice with talking about maths and writing at the same time. Um, it just means that you don't have to spend double the time kind of explaining something and then having to draw it out or write it out. Um, but yeah, apart from that, um, uh, well, one, one, actually one other thing that I thought you did very well was 
at this st step, you remembered that we already had a formula for this. So lots of students may have panicked about that and not, or, you know, not really known what to do with that. But we looked earlier at that formula and you picked up that that's going to be the crucial part in getting like the cube formula and the four formula. So when I asked you for 50, R to the 50, you realize you can't just go straight to 50. You have to do three, four, five, six, seven, up to 50, um, like so. Um, so you well spotted those patterns. Again, that's one of the things they're looking out for is adaptability. If you're given a new scenario, can you remember the, the parts the, and try and mimic the techniques that you learn in one setting and apply them in an unfamiliar setting? Um, awesome. Really, really well done. Um, so hopefully you won't have to do an interview like that again uh, in the sense that, uh, I, I, you know, obviously very nervous, uh, very stressful interviews can be. So uh, I really appreciate you giving your time. Uh, any viewers at home uh, have any questions, please drop them in the comments um, and do make sure to like and subscribe. But thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much to Isabel. And I'll catch you in the next one. Have a great day.